Good evening, everyone. We are so happy that you have joined us. I am Cindy Lott. I'm the academic director, and I am a, fa a faculty member in nonprofit management uh, here at the School of Professional Studies at Columbia University. And we are so glad that you have joined us this evening for a very special event. Um, this is our event around advancing DEI practice and philanthropy, grant making, and engagement. Um, I am going to allow our moderator, Gloria Johnson Cusack, who is one of our part-time lecturers in our program, introduce her panelists tonight. I just wanted to frame this up very, very briefly before I turn it over to Gloria. So this is part of a larger diversity, equity, inclusion series that our program has started and is working with other programs at the School of Professional Studies on. We've had a series of events, all of which you can find on the website. Um, I'm hoping that someone will drop that into the chat this evening. And we have one more event uh, for the next month before the semester ends as well. So stay tuned for all of that. And Gloria will remind you of that at the end. It is fundamental to our nonprofit sector and also to our nonprofit management program that we really delve deeply into DEI issues. This can involve a lot of different junctures, a lot of different intersections within our work as nonprofit managers. And by nonprofit, I wanna define it a little bit as well. We often think about nonprofits as being kind of the infrastructure groups and the service groups and the arts groups that are actually doing the work on the ground, but of course it includes the philanthropic side of the coin as well. And that is how we are going to be addressing this this evening. Um, there is a lot actually being written right now on DEI and philanthropy. You may have seen there was a recent large study that I'm sure will be discussed tonight um, in thinking about how we see grant making and whether there's actually inclusivity around grant making as well. Um, these are really, really important issues. Today, the White House held a briefing, probably the first one I can remember in my many years of doing policy work. Uh, the White House held a briefing specifically around uh, the COVID, the, uh, the legislation around COVID and how that would impact the nonprofit sector. There is a lot going on, um, a lot of change we're hoping afoot in, ter in terms of thinking about policy in this space. And we cannot do that now without addressing some of these fundamental issues around DEI. So we are very, very grateful that you've joined. We want you to stay active in the chat. Uh, however, if you do have questions for the panelists, we need you to direct those to the Q&A specifically. And I am quite sure that Gloria will remind you of that as well. Uh, with that, I want to turn this over to Gloria Johnson Cusack. We are honored to have her and count her as one of our own, our faculty. She has been with us as we move through creating this nonprofit management curriculum. She's taught at least two of our classes, and this is her panel this evening. I want to thank you again and thank Julie Gerke and Randall Russell for joining us this evening. With that, I turn it over to Gloria. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. It's been a pleasure pulling this together, and I just want to thank you for your vision for uh, encouraging us to just go hard and, and to be innovative in the DEI space, even uh, before things got to the place where they are now, where thankfully uh, lots of folks are, are, are focused on DEI uh, intentionality. A special welcome to Julie and Randy. Uh, you all are going to notice very quickly that we are quite comfortable with each other. We've had a lot of fun uh, preparing. I have had the pleasure of working closely uh, with both of you uh, through the years, making good trouble, uh, as Congressman John Lewis says, and uh, we are not going to stop in our efforts to really push hard on DEI uh, strategy. So we're going to mix it up real soon. I'm going to invite uh, Julie and Ray to introduce themselves. And what I've asked them to do is to sort of be prepared to comment on the one or two feelings they've got about uh, embarking uh, on this work. We talk a lot amongst ourselves about the fact that, you know, most people don't wake up in the morning figuring out how can I marginalize whole populations of people uh, and to further advantage um, those that have had advantage um, for centuries. And yet we know that we have to be intentional about undoing systems that have uh, been put in place sometimes very intentionally by people who woke up every morning trying to figure out how to marginalize folks. And we think a lot about unconscious bias and all of the ways that we can bring people of goodwill into this effort. And so it's a tough uh, journey that we're upon, but one that we're excited about. And so I thought we'd just start by sort of asking them how they feel about the work they're doing as they describe uh, what their organizations are um, doing and their roles there. So Julie, you wanna start? Sure. 
first, thank you for having me. Um, it's a real privilege to be here um, and part of this conversation. And I think, um, so first I'm Julie Grigge. I work at walmart.org, which is the philanthropic work of Walmart. Um, I've been there about 13 years. Um, and when I think about this work, I really do think about the privilege it is to do the work. Um, and I know that we use privilege in a lot of ways in this space, but the journey that we're on means a lot of listening to people, giving candid feedback, um, being really honest, and that's a privilege to get that. Um, and then you pair that with hopefully what comes up is real intentionality with a vision for transformation, um, but also a recognition that it's not always a, a very straight and direct road. Um, and that humility that comes with, oops, we made a mistake. Oh, we went in the wrong direction. We've got a lot farther to go than we thought. Those kinds of things I think um, are really essential as we do this, but I'm, I'm just always struck by the, the gift um, of going on this journey with people who will share insight, feedback, experience um, that cover for blind spots and privilege and all of the themes that each of us have in different ways, but particularly um, I think white leaders in this space particularly um, need voices and feedback um, as they go on it. Thanks. Thanks. Randy? So as I think about the feeling I have entering this space, first I want to also say thank you. What a privilege to have this conversation. And I use that language, Julie, all the time. So another similarity we're finding. I, I approach this, you know, we often describe this kind of leadership as servant leadership. Um, and I would call this much more mission leadership um, because it takes your own internal heart and soul to look at yourself and your work and your spot. What can I do from where I am using what I have? So that, that to me is <clears throat> much more mission-based and that's how I find myself doing this work. I'll also say that there's a, um, <clears throat> the gratitude experience of knowing and feeling comforted by the fact that there is something so clearly wrong and it can be righted. And I am very clear about that path and blame, um, accusation, struggle, problem listing are so unproductive that I like to stay much more in the positive lane. Um, the, the good Buddha says that, you know, the root of all suffering is trying to make what is something different. So we cannot pretend racism doesn't exist and solve it. And that does require an internal and external journey. And I think that's a part of this whole process and experience. And I totally agree with Julie. You know, um, sometimes I feel a bit like a poser because who am I to talk about race? On the other hand, it is a white problem. It's a white construct. It's a white implementation of how we are. So I am not a poser, I am an actor. And it, you know, how do you step into the space with your own internal confidence? Is that so that those feelings all come up when you ask me where I am at this moment and stepping into this room? Well, thank you. We, we thought it'd be important to just sort of set the tone for what's going to be essentially a really brass tacks conversation about grant making and authentic engagement uh, with communities as opposed to that other stuff, you know, where we engage community members after all the decisions have been made. Uh, but we thought it would be important to sort of help people understand where we're coming from um, in our own personal space. So I think what our participants will see is that we, we share a whole bunch, the three of us. Um, we're all three lifelong learners uh, in what we do. And we appreciate that this is a long game uh, around DEI transformation. Uh, we're all knee deep in helping to lead complex organizations. Uh, I'm doing that most recently now at, at Florida International University where our president literally committed to an enterprise-wide transformation on DEI, the fourth largest university um, in the country. And we're all, I think, equally freaked out about the limits of this hour and 15 minutes we've got uh, when we spend lots of time thinking about the complexities of this. We're going to try to um, get to as much content as possible. Uh, and so we're going to do that by 
making sure that we provide just a little bit of context, but then leave as much time as we can um, for questions from those of you that are join, joining us. I think we've got more than 200 uh, or so um, folks who are joining us, graduate students, practitioners from everywhere, uh, and leader, they're leaders in higher education uh, in the nonprofit sector and in philanthropy. So we're going to start by sharing very quickly, for all of you who just kind of want to know where we're going with this, we're going to start very quick, quickly uh, for context with discussing why our institutions are increasing uh, DEI intentionality now more than ever. And then we're going to jump straight to discussion about what we're doing and then our favorite part, what we're learning. And all of us have slides where we're going to be, try to be very specific uh, and leave you with those slides for you to come back and get on the website, uh, hopefully to continue the learning and, and, and sharing uh, the insights with the, those team members um, that you have now um, in your, wherever it is you sit. So we're going to start, we're starting here with this inverted pyramid before I have Randy and um, Julie jump in. And this is just to make sure that we're all clear about the way we're framing and thinking about DEI. So this is something that I use to try to be very explicit about what are the dimensions of DEI. How do we know that we're actually manifesting it? And so if we look at this pyramid, if you start at the bottom, at the very least, our organizations are advancing on DEI if we have representation. That's literally body, physical representation of people, whether it's in our, on our boards, the staff members, the people that we're listening to. That's pretty much where many of our organizations, as well-meaning as we may be, are starting, right? If we just look at the numbers um, of people uh, that are, are running organizations or even have them as part of, of their teams. As we become more mature, and intentional, then we should have more people of color, that is Black, Indigenous people of color, the term now that is commonly known as BIPOC, so you'll hear us say that um, during our time together, more of those, those uh, communities, those individuals are providing input on decision making. But what we're aiming for is the top of this pyramid. We're aiming for having full participation of marginalized uh, individuals and communities who are going to be influencing power. who are going to influence the prioritization of messaging that is articulating what matters and therefore what matters most, and then who have power to command finances and human capital. And that is the highest manifestation when we're doing our job. So we try to sort of center our conversations on this so that all of us can start thinking about the different dimensions and the different ways that we might be um, aiming to have more uh, um, equity uh, and then looking at where we are in, in practicality. So with that very quick setup, I'm going to turn it really quickly to Julie uh, and ask you to start with sort of describing why your foundation is pursuing DEI with so much more intentionality now than ever. And then Randy will come right after, and then we'll keep going and get more to the brass tacks about how. So Julie? Sure. Um, and I mean, I think there's an obvious answer that it's the right thing to do, but at the same point, um, I ground, I've, I've been really influenced by a lot of people and there are two women who have given me visuals that I come back to a lot in this journey. So the first is Angela Glover Bothwell, who many may know as the founder of PolicyLink and has done a lot of work in this space. Um, and she talks about the curb cut effect. So those divots in our curb sidewalks, um, just to give you a visual of that and really the, the outcome of solving that, which really was with people in wheelchairs in mind, but now is serves bikers and strollers and travelers with roller suitcases um, and really, to me, illustrates that often in working on equity, there's a very clear benefit to everybody. While you may be solving for one issue of a group, um, it often has really ripple effects that um, expand the pie and really take what can be often positioned as a zero-sum game to very much broaden it um, and expand the pie. And so. That's one 
really piece that gives me in the world of philanthropy, we often think about outcomes and showing that outcomes in DEI work often benefit everyone. Um, and then the second is a story that's more about internal teams um, and comes from Francis Fry, who's a Harvard Business School professor, who talks about um, three circles and those, are, those represent team members. And if you have people on the team all who think the same and have similar backgrounds, fundamentally you have concentric circles. And that is the limits of your knowledge and your creativity. Um, then if you have those circles more like a Venn diagram, you have farther reaches, but without inclusive leadership, without a, a real cultural, cultural belonging, all you get from those team members is the work in the overlap, in what those places where they have shared experience and you lose so much of the edges of knowledge where there's difference and interest. Um, but in well-managed diverse teams, you get all three of the full circles spread out, covering more ground, more insights. Um, and to me, that's just a really powerful um, representation of why diverse teams with inclusive environments and cultures produce better results um, and really do have more innovation, um, more ability to solve, and that's been proven over and over again. And so when I'm thinking about the team, I come back to the concentral circles. When I'm thinking about outcomes of the work, I come back to curb cut, but there's really this sense that it benefits everyone. And it often takes our closed mindsets that think of things as very limited um, and very kind of pieces of the pie to really how do we grow our experience um, and take advantage of what is really the the real advantage of diversity when equity and belonging are a part of it. So it's a very practical way of achieving outcomes that we care about, in addition to being the moral, the good things, and all of that, and important Absolutely. things to run in. So we've got a preview of some of the, the how that you're going to talk about later. But before we go into that, I'd like to invite Randy to see if you want to jump in and share a bit about your why now more than ever. Sure. So we have a slightly different story. Um, and our story is different because as a private independent foundation based in a local place-based setting, we are different than a corporate foundation who has global needs to sort of aspire to. So when we approach DEI, um, our foundation started out of, uh, out of just a, a, a a pot bucket of money that showed up. I'm not gonna tell the story about it how because it doesn't matter, but this amount of money showed up, it wasn't asked for, it wasn't uh, predetermined. And a group of people, uh, a board basically found a me and I'm a change agent. And how a foundation hired a change agent instead of the traditional kind of leader that might be you know, somebody who's in the finance world, for example, would be more traditional. So what pivoted about that for all of us was we learned and knew how social change worked. So we also knew this private free money, what's its best and highest use? And we also knew the genesis of most of the human problems in our county were due to race. So we, within three years, moved from using a social determinant platform um, there's a slide on this, I think, somewhere. The, there's a, so we went from using a social determinant platform, end up framing health equity, and then got to race equity. Well, since that's the purpose of our foundation, DEI had to be ensconced in every single layer. We had to re-recruit the board. We had to really think about the staff. Our staff has to do a race equity questionnaire before they even apply. Uh, telling us their journey about where they are in race equity because we're so deep in it that we really believe it. We created a center to sort of open the front door to let community in so we got community voice to listen. So we, we became what I had always articulated or thought about, DEI is not a destination, it's a way of being. And so how can we become that as a foundation and mirror that back to the community while using evidence? Um, so, you know, one, one hard example of the why, uh, our local economy, which is now somewhere in the $12 billion range, if we had true race equity, according to policy link analysis of our county, we'd add another $3 billion to our economy. It's smart economically. It's morally right. 
and I keep asking questions of our county leaders who we've amassed together to hold accountable, why are we accepting that there are fewer people of the, as a percentage of the population who are 65 and older who are black and brown in our county? Why are we accepting that they just die early and that they have more disease and that's okay with us? So, you know, the moral responsibility of philanthropy can also be in place, backed up by meeting people where they are. Um, so I think this is, a, this is a huge part of our why and the sort of the genesis of it came from that very grassrootsy feel of we can make change, we've seen it, how do we really want to apply it? Our main theory of philanthropy is the wisdoms in the community, how do we get the lived experience up to the voices of power? Because we deeply believe those with power, when they see and hear fully, will act. A lot of faith that we're putting in each other and that's the way to go. It certainly does animate a lot of what we do with otherwise pretty exhausting work. Yeah. So for those of you now that are, are looking for the brass tacks, here we go. We're about to pivot to it. Um, I know that when I do these kinds of um, sessions with luminaries like these folks here, I pull up my cell phone and I take pictures of the slides. So uh, you're gonna get them on the website, but you might wanna get ready to take pictures of the slides because we're gonna go there now. Uh, so we're going to switch back to Julie and ask um, Julie to delve a little bit more into the how of your approach to grant making uh, and authentic community uh, engagement and sort of talk us through um, how you, your journey has sort of moved. I know we discussed sort of thinking about helping people understand that you've you got to kind of start at the place that makes sense and then have a... a, a some intention about moving, but know that it's going to, as you said, not be all linear. And so this is the way you decided to present that. Would you sort of talk to us about what your journey has looked like and do as much as you can to help people understand where the easy choices might be lying on that early step side of the, uh, of the slide and then how the harder thing happens, but give us some insights about how to get there. Sure, um, thanks. And I think part of what I'd say is I think that probably varies by organization and structure and, you know, neither Randy or I fundraise, that changes things. Um, you know, all of these structural questions of how your organization um, is structured, where the dollars come from, all of that changes what's easy and hard in your context. Um, and so, you know, for us, it started, it's, it's fundamentally been embedded in my entire time at Walmart, but thinking about how we accelerate it, how we go more intentional, um, I would say about four years ago was a decision to think more explicitly about this. And it started with, frankly, a lot of assessment. Um, using third parties, and Gloria, you were helpful in this, um, to think about, to talk to our staff about what their experience was, um, and what their visions of the work we should be doing are, to get feedback from our grantees. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we started embedding questions about our diversity, equity, and inclusion practices in our grantee perception survey done by the Center for Effective Philanthropy, as many people use, um, and really assessing where are we, what do our stakeholders um, see as important next steps. And it wasn't quite, quite that clean, you know, it wasn't like, oh, we'll assess and then we'll go. And, you know, I think the reality is, and for those of you at different places on this, it's, there are often multiple threads going at multiple times thinking about how, um, and in a structured world that can be hard and bringing a lot of recognition that that is good, that that means if you're going linear, it's sometimes very slow um, versus, embracing that multiple threads are working at the same time. Um, I would say we had a couple of program officers who were stronger from the get-go. And I don't think that's uncommon in philanthropic organizations to have some leading program officers who really do get it and embed it in strategy, in ways of working, in really um, their work, in ways that help all of us learn. Um, and so looking at data and disaggregating it early, thinking about what um, the portfolio of 
funding looks like from a race equity standpoint, not only who is being served, but who's leading the organizations um, that you fund. Those kinds of steps of analysis um, really were, I wouldn't say every program officer took it at the same time, um, but you have a couple of leading ones who really, um, for us, helped us see and then help teach and illustrate for other program officers. There's deep work that we do with program officers talking about what the, to Randy's point, the competency required when you're committed to this in all of the staff and making it clear from hiring, um, embedding it in the culture, all of the pieces of doing the, your own work internally. This can't just be about what you fund and how you fund, it's gotta be also in your day-to-day -day lived experience as a team and um, engaging the board. Um, those were really important conversations, which eventually became an approved statement of prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion as a core belief and practice of the work. Um, and so those are things that started um, I think it evolved into not just having what we'd had forever, which is a budget line named diversity, equity, and inclusion, but really bringing that lens to everything we do um, and saying that this isn't a side project, it's embedded in all of the work. Um, it is, you know, committed to long-term learning of the staff and embedded that in everything from team meetings to annual trainings. Um, it is funding it for grantees who need to go on this journey. Um, we've done uh, communities of practice among grantees where we fund them to accelerate their diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. Um, it is figuring out, you know, you talked about what's hard. We're a structure of 30 people that do about $300 million of grant making a year, and we're all based in the US doing global work and all frankly in primarily Arkansas. And so recognizing the limitations that brings and the trust that you need to bring to those on the ground and their voices and thinking about the power dynamics of that. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's a quick framework that we use because I work in a place where I submit an annual plan, we do need to have work streams, those kinds of things. And so this gives you a sense of how those, what was a messy threads get into work streams where we really try to advance it. And so I talked about this team culture and the program officer competency and how we're continuing to accelerate that. And we think, you know, what are we taking on this year? What's next year? It's a journey and it's not a kind of one and done, um, but rather these are things that are always in it. What's our funding process and structure? You know, we just redid our entire application um, to embed this as part of the process um, with grantees as part of the design and um, giving feedback along the way, thinking about those power dynamics and getting to really places where, you know, we are thinking in that way. It's every strategy. Um, it is both, we now have a center for racial equity, which is direct and head on, but each strategy and how is this embedded and what is the funding looking like year over year and how is it growing? Who is it going to? And that analysis that tracks over time. And then I think, you know, as was alluded to in the opening, philanthropy's got a long way to go and we have a long way to go. How are we part of the field's transformation um, and participating in communities of practice ourselves to learn and get feedback? funding the voices of people who are helping the field transform. Um, all of that is really part of how we think about it. One of the things that I know um, you cared a lot about, uh, as, as did your leadership, was finding a way to, shall I say, mitigate the power dynamics so that you could get your grantees to be really honest with you about how you could be a part of the problem in the way that you did grant making and wrote the applications and did the evaluations. Is there one specific thing that you would call out, one specific practice, technical or otherwise, that you would suggest people consider uh, for that goal? Yeah, I mean, look, I think you have to go at this from a lot of angles. 
um, and recognize what works for one grantee is different than another grantee. Um, and so, you know, I don't think there's a silver bullet to solve that. But I would say our grantee perception survey is something we take really seriously. The survey. Um, yeah, and so this is a third party. We use the Center for Effective Philanthropy. They, they do this for hundreds of thousands of foundations. Um, so you can not only see your performance, you can compare it to other foundations. Um, and we embedded diversity, equity, and inclusion questions, which they now do as normative. They didn't a couple of years ago. We started doing that so that we could get a really honest assessment and see it, frankly, by program officer, by topic we fund in, um, by strategy, because it often varies what the experience is. Um, and getting that is a starting place to then be really talking to program officers about how to build trust, how to listen to open critique and feedback and make changes based on that. Yeah. So I know you've been very generous about sharing your learnings when you taught classes with me at Columbia and in other sessions. So I'm gonna volunteer you and say that I know um, that um, practitioners may want to consult with you all about the technical aspects of that you learn are helpful to, for getting people to be honest uh, because it's a pretty important thing. Thank you. All righty, Randy, you ready to jump up? Okay, you guys get ready to take pictures of more slides because we've got them coming. <laughs> Randy, yeah. you want to talk about your how? Sure. Um, so this is a little bit about the why, but I want to use it to set the context for the how. So. Um, on this slide, we're basically, I'm explaining to you that there's a, a, an in-group and an out-group of ways we think about DEI. So while we looked at our current conditions, as Julie mentioned, with data, um, so we really did a deep scan of, of our county from a race equity point of view and also discovered just how many pieces of data that do not count race or that data exists that you cannot disaggregate. So that led us down a path of wanting to understand how to describe the problems better and do some of that research. We also start with a very clear premise that you know, for 100 years, at least 100 years, very decidedly and purposely, this country passed laws that said people with different skin tones were less than human. And so how do you undo those laws and write those cultures that were created? And this is not about fault, it's about acceptance that there is a history here of really discriminatory practice that requires an equity lift. Race equity requires something different to happen to create the lift. So what are we gonna do in our theory with systems change? And on the next slide, if you don't mind advancing, I wanted to get to the, the sort of how of some of this. And this is a very high level, and these are gonna be our strategic directions for the upcoming years. Um, uh, you know, really, we do this in five ways, and each one of these circles has DEI intention laced throughout it. So why do we need a movement? Because social change requires pressure, and a movement of people who have certain ideas um, are needed to make that pressure happen. Well, how do you engage people in a movement? You don't. You shut up and listen. Um, and that listening part happens in a number of ways. The engagement happens because if you listen well, you create the pathways for people to engage. So that has a lot of DEI in it. We only use, you know, I've hired very specific uh, folks. And again, I'm in a local place-based setting, which is a very different dynamic than a, than a global foundation. But in this way, and in this challenge to ourselves, how to use this money to the highest degree, Listening takes multiple channels. So it's data, it's direct listening to lived experience and doing translational communications about what that experience means to systems leaders. Um, and it's also galvanizing people through a program we call Courageous Conversations. So we've now taken 600 people through this course, including city councils and uh, elected officials. And it's two days to explore your own racial autobiography. Because part of the DEI work is if you don't, think about this internally, then you're not manifesting externally because this is a way of being and you have to change a way of being if you've been living in white culture and that's just a fact. Then we realize that the most lasting change is systems change or so our North Char Star is really to influence change. Well, we do that through recruitment and using our moral and our social and our reputational capital. Um, what does that mean? That means we can sit down now with the CEO of Raymond James or the superintendent of schools, or the county administrator and say, what are you doing in your DEI work? 
for race equity. And we are introducing DEI throughout systems and holding up the mirror by data, but also by influence to say, we've, we've got to change our way of being in these systems and change rules, protocols, practices, ordinances, in a number of ways to make things move along. Our big bet, the next 15 year bet, is that the biggest lift, we, we know uh, what, what community wealth is. This is not just about income to black and brown people, although that is a part of it. It is also about the assets we stripped away in the practice of the United States through redlining and other things by devaluing property that was owned by people of color. So the idea here is how do we advance this community wealth and that will build a resilience to health. There's no better example than COVID. Right? We know very clearly that COVID shows us that there's no resilience in a community who's having to uh, live on the decades long history of having to take the jobs that are paying less overall. Then our investments, which is our grant making, right? So we're, we've changed our whole way of being. I started in responsive grant making uh, when I got here six years ago. Um, and uh, over three years, we put out $21 million. We learned in 704 different grant requests, what people wanted, where people were thinking. It was another way of listening. It wasn't intended to solve the problem. We also added for the, uh, the outcome of this investment process, an expectation that started moving us very clearly to race equity. Post George Floyd's murder, we were the only ones saying race equity previous to that. Subsequent to that, we've had to really pivot and understand our adaptability as a private foundation now has to fuel people's imagination and hold people accountable to those beautiful statements that came out a few weeks after the event. And then finally, we think of our capital and this, uh, the, the scaling of our capital and this social, moral, intellectual, reputational and financial capital. So we're not just one thing. So how do we take $160 million and invest it in local impact investing and help create this idea of a black business incubator um, that lifts up people of color and communities of color who've not been given the same opportunities or investments over the years. So I think that's a, that's a piece of how we are beginning to imagine our how. Uh, and there's a couple of other slides in here that give specific measures. I'm not I sure. I love them, they're my favorite. I'm not sure if they're next Lonnie, but I'll touch on those yeah. there. Yeah, there they are. So there's four uh, parts to this on two slides. So this is what we are working on to share with our board our progress and hold ourselves accountable. So internally, we don't have a meeting about anything unless a person of color is in the room. Um, the board is the same way. There's not a committee that we can meet with without a person of color in the room. So that's just the basics, right? But then what do we do? We take them on a journey of how did we handle race equity today? Did what you do in, you know, hit on race equity today? So you see some of these measures here and the ways in which we think about it. Go ahead to the next slide, please. And then the last two are this idea of, of uh, refining strategic investment. I wanna pause there a minute because it's a way of inculcating DEI work into grant making practice. And what we call it is our equity thinker. And what the equity thinker does is first ask, is this the right group to do this work? Are there other partners that should be brought to the table? Is this about systems change or is it about solving a problem of today? Is this something our foundation should do? And if not, then who, how can we help this group get funding for their work? And or that's a great idea. Let's start meeting with them for the next several years. So our strategic race equity investments now are very focused and they're built out efforts being led by the community. The community wants to focus on mental health. We're focused on mental health. They wanted health in all policies across multiple elected systems. They have health in all policies across those systems. So this is to me the way of being community led and insisting that race equity be a component of, of all pieces. And I just made the point about the full capital. It's so good, so good. And so if we go to the next slide, I see you all are uh, peppering us with great questions. So we're going to this is our last slide, um, and then we're going to open up and I'm going to start tossing out some questions from um, those of you. This is a, a slide that um, Julie and Randy um, and I decided was important because it, it's a way uh, for me to kind of be 
persistent, insistent, and maybe obnoxious about <laughs> accentuating some pretty important themes. Uh, and the headline of, of this slide is to basically say, think about the business model and be realistic about your organization and the context in which you're working to decide how to set your goals. And by doing that, you enhance your chances uh, of being able to align your resources, internal as well as external, to get the most impact, even when you're trying to juggle between the short term and clearly the longer term work, which is the more sustainable systemic work that I think all of us care about, there has to be a balance. And so it seems from the work that we've done together that often the struggle, especially with boards that are just beginning to move into this space of DEI intentionality, many of whom have a very strong business perspective, the thing that they struggle with is figuring out how to do that balance. And I think we would all agree it's an art, not a science. So the, here's an example of sort of contrasting an awareness about where an institution is in, the, in their own ecosystem and the life cycle of those organizations and what, is a, what are realistic goals. So if you read from the left, an example here um, is Florida International University and comparing that with the Firelight Foundation. So, I'm senior advisor to the president at, an, at a higher ed institution that in many ways is in um, operating in, in a situation that is similar to nonprofits, where DEI intentionality is a means to improve outcomes for customers that are already established, you know, tied to the mission and vision of that nonprofit. And that's sort of pre-established whether those organizations and, and the people that are leading them from the board level to the executive are thinking about DEI or not. And most of them by nature have not started there, right? We're all kind of coming into this space and thinking about DEI as a strategy, as a means to achieving outcomes. So in this case, the business model for a complex higher ed institution that already exists around which most of the goals and metrics are assigned, are aligned, is interested among other things, but primarily in improving student graduation rates, them being able to excel and obviously the, the impact that that has on national rankings for that organization. What that means is that as we move into more DEI intentionality, we have to try to then notice what gaps already exist in the way that in this case, the, uh, this university has been serving its students. So one example has to do with black males at the institution. There's all kinds of data. Randy and Julie talked a lot about the importance of having it to understand where your starting point is that shows that there are challenges for black males at the university. It's been a, an ongoing trend. Okay, so that's low hanging fruit. What we found is that in order to get traction on this issue, it is often helpful, this is about getting buy-in, the point that both of you started with, of sort of talking about how DEI intentionality is, is best achieved when we articulate how it's good for all people. We're finding that we get traction when we talk about the benefits of having better interventions, of, of, me, of sort of closing those gaps around the ways that we, we serve and support Black males. And to make very clear to leaders of the organization in this example, that as a result of being intentional around black males, we're likely to yield better research, educational, financial, and mental health practices that benefit not just those black males, but many others like first generation students who are a big proportion of our population set. So this is thinking sort of multidimensionally about ways that we can not only achieve certain outcomes that are good for the so-called out group, but also see that it's going to benefit others and be able to get buy-in, especially as we're just beginning to lean into that work. The contrast is the Firelight Foundation, Silicon Valley-based foundation that does work in Africa. Their aspirations are similar to many foundations, not as many as we'd like, but many who think about DEI as being the end game. So in our case, this foundation, which has existed for more than 15 years, was created already with a business model 
focused on improving community-driven systems change, empowering African leaders to name their own priorities and to be integral in deciding how the strategy should get built, built to solve it. And then we figure out how to invest capital to enable that kind of, of work. So the DEI lens means as we have become much more intentional, we've already always done that. But within the last year, we've decided we're actually going to go hard on having more African leadership in our US-based board, which heretofore has been mostly dominated by people who are not of color and not African. And, and we're now have, we now have a whole strategy of transitioning a lot of the power, the decision-making about messaging resources people to the program officers on the African continent having the financial decision-making happening in the continent of Africa. And the benefit obviously is that we, in a global economy, have stronger children and communities and therefore um, thriving economies for everybody. But um, for a lot of the fundraising we do, again, to those of you that have to do fundraising, if you're on the nonprofit side, what we urge is that people think about articulating to those existing funders or the potential funders that, this intentionality is going to yield incomes in very tangible ways that align to the mission and that are realistic, okay? So we hope, hope that that's helpful and that this will create some um, healthy conversation among your groups. Okay, so we're gonna go straight now to the next slide, which is the one you all have been waiting for, which is your question. And I am going to start by asking a question. Uh, that was offered uh, about uh, competencies for program officers. And this one goes to Julie, but Randy, I know you're way in this work too. The question is, can you share more about what competency around DEI looks like for a program officer? What elements make up the competence, competency and how is it measured? And then I'll ask another one that you all can be thinking about also. It is about your grant applications. Do you only fund nonprofit organizations with a fully fleshed out plan for DEI? Many nonprofits inherently tackle racial injustices, but they may not have specific internal strategies or a department that's focused on it. So how is this considered in the review process to align with the funders goals for DEI? All right, you all can just jump in however you want. Randy, you wanna start? Sure. So um, I know, Julie, you're going to have some specific things related to the grant side of it, but I would add that there's a component of competency that is for the work of DEI. What is your previous exposure and experience and what is your willingness to go on a journey? And that's a competence that's hard to screen for, which is how we ended up with the essay component. Um, but really, you know, we, we don't need someone who doesn't believe in DEI. That's not a helpful outcome, you know. So how do you screen for that? Well, you ask and talk about it. But I think I'll weave in the, another answer that I saw or a question that I saw come in that I wanted to weigh in on too in this answer, which is, you know, with, if an organization does not have DEI, then we want to give them funding and get them support and help to get their DEI work done, especially if they are serving toward a mission of the foundation, right? So it's not so much that the, 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 this organization or these organizations have an idea, it's then our responsibility to make sure that the DEI and the training and the support and the ideas come along with it. So philanthropy can't just stop at the place of saying, you know, you applied for this and we gave you a grant and you didn't do it. I think now we're understanding this has to be much more in partnership, especially if we're asking for a new way of being. And the final thing I'd say about competency is there, there has to be an array, is my thinking. So however, whatever the scale is of your staff, if you have two, then you want very different two, right? And if you have seven or 10, then what content areas around race equity can they talk about or does their experience have? So sometimes the competency is hired in because you realize you're working on an area and you're looking for something specific. Um, but I think that's, that's the, the piece I would lean into. Great. Yeah, Randy, I agree. So, you know, I have the advantage of working in a large institution that has an entire diversity, equity, and inclusion 
department. So everybody at Walmart has a competency around diversity, equity, and inclusion um, that starts with inclusive behaviors, how you engage colleagues, something that you would expect, you know, an institution that believes in this, but has a huge amount of diversity and skills and types of jobs to have is the base. We then build on it with two things. And Randy, I would really echo what you just said. So it is this personal commitment to be on the journey um, and how people are engaging in that, how you know, we build individual development plans for growth and development, how are they embedded in that? And that looks different for everybody. Um, there is no one size fits all. My colleague that's a, you know, with certain lived experience needs different things than I need or, but, you know, still would say, hey, here's my next step on the journey. And so there is this piece of individualized learning that is both um, tangible, learning the history of how we got here and the systems that were built and that created the inequity um, and inequity of outcomes that exist, but also the personal evolution um, and listening. So that's the second piece. The third piece is then the brass tacks of how is this person embedding, disaggregating data as they build strategy? Do they naturally, as they're building grants, embed a piece of equity into the work? Do they have a natural inclination and regularly think about how are voices of those we're serving shaping this work? Um, and those come together to be the competency um, that we look for. We both hire for it and evaluate it um, each year and think of it as really all of our jobs. Yeah. Uh, we've got, oh, Randy, you wanna say something else? Okay, we've got lots of questions about um, engaging more white people in the effort. And since you are two of my favorite, most activist, good trouble white people in philanthropy, which is why we're together now, I want you to lean hard into this one about um, what you find works well. And, and if you can, please, Share what works well when people of color are trying to engage white people, and also what works well when white people are trying to engage white people. What lessons have you learned that are not obvious to most folks? Maybe? Julie, why don't you take this first? Sure. Um, I think the first is it has to be very much in my own journey of listening and learning. Um, and so, you know, I have had moments where I thought I was advocating for the right thing and a colleague of color who I thought I was advocating on behalf of pulled me aside and not, said, that's not what I want. Um, and so really making sure that that's a piece of it and that you aren't kind of owning the agenda um, is I think one of the things white people really have, and all leaders, but white leaders in particular, have to make sure that as they advocate you know, it's really easy to think you're being doing the right thing without checking the agenda setting and um, making sure that that is shared and really mu very much um, with and on behalf of. And then I think as a white leader, you get to be in spaces and say things um, and not passing those moments on, asking the question, reframing it. Um, Can you give us an example? Sure. Um, I mean, I thought one of the things Randy said is really early on was a good one of like, you know, who's in the room here? Um, and just, you know, being very intentional of saying that out loud um, as decisions are made and being intentional that those rooms are not homogenous as decisions are made even explicitly naming that question makes people think differently, much less, you know, in moments where I often find questions can be incredibly empowering. You know, have you talked to somebody about that? Where did that come, where, where are you getting that belief? Um, those kinds of things that are often I find cause people to re-examine and realize that there was a bias or a inherent just assumption that's incorrect that led them to an outcome and a perception that's just inaccurate. Um, 
Where so those are some of the things belief? I think I love about. It. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Where did you get that belief? I love it. Randy? So I know you, you know, got a bunch of examples because I've heard some lately. <laughs> so I wanted to cast this in sort of the framing of, you know, when you ask someone to change, what's the first thing that happens is fear, right? And then, you know, the answer is no. So when you challenge a belief, a system, a history, ignorance, not knowing, um, there is, it's incredibly vulnerable. So, so how do you talk to white people? Well, first you do, right? The first thing is you have intention. And then the second part of that is like any cycle of engagement with any human, you, in my mind anyway, you shut up and listen. And people love to talk about themselves and their beliefs if you ask the right questions, right? So how did you get to that? How did you know that? Just like Julie said, we actually call it professional dating. Um, and it's really this idea that with intention, so we have as part of our outcomes, uh, one of our employees, Marcus, has to talk to 30 corporations this year and get to a place where he's able to pitch DEI. Right now, you know, he may or may not get to 30, he may or may not get there, but that's the intention, right? So and then we pick them strategically because of their likelihood to be engaged in an action that the foundation's interested in. So the intention matters a lot. The history support, how do I say this, from, from a case manager point of view, so I'm a trained social worker, right? So you would not put frontline workers out without support behind them. So the people who are having these conversations need reflection space and time, and they also need support. And so building in the infrastructure inside the organization so that people can do this work matters. And the last thing I would say is constant training, support, and opportunities to talk. Language is hard. And so people lose their temper, lose their cool. I'm a passionate guy. And if there's, you know, one of my concrete examples is uh, the Chamber of Commerce, when I first got here, invited me to speak. And of course, I was using, you know, the health equity and race equity frame even before the foundation grabbed it because we were sort of headed that way. I was met in the parking lot with a finger in my chest saying, you can never say that again not in any room we're in. And I want you to tell me why you think you can say that. So that gentleman, oddly, was an employee, was a contract uh, lawyer for the foundation. And I found his response and behavior. What race was that person? He was white. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I took him on in my head and I sort of said, all right, I'm going to make that guy see something that he hasn't seen before because I got to understand this. Um, and I think it was, you know, all the things you would imagine, painful lunches for me, but really also gratitude for finally finding something that I could celebrate with him. And I will not say he's crossed the crevasse, but he's no longer using language like, well, I can't find a black person with that skill, right? Which I've let him understand is a really dismissive way to behave. That's such a lazy approach. And all it costs- I can't you, find. <laughs> right, all it costs you for equity is to try harder, right? I mean, come on. That's so, so, you know, the reality there is, is that I think the white leadership has vast, it's how do you talk to people who are already invested in their work. So if you challenge their organization, then you're challenging them personally. It's, it's really hard work. And, and the expectation should not be that you're gonna take the bell curve of people thinking about race, they're already under the tent, they need fueling. You got some people on this side of the bell curve, you wanna keep pulling, but I'm not so sure how much time we should spend on people who are against all of this, um, because it really only takes 25% of any population working on change to reach a tipping point. So. Several people are, are doing this. Amen, amen, <laughs> we all get that there has to be far more um, inclusion, uh, representation of, of uh, black indigenous people of color in boards and at the highest level. And yet we all know that many of these complex organizations, powerful organizations have, as one person said, very limited networks. They operate in very small niches. So can you share about what leaders, especially um, at the CEO level and just below can do to create environments where um, people in power, white people in power especially, can be exposed to different kinds of people with the skill sets that they need so that when they're in the room, just by being there, they will, as you said, Julie, ask questions, question assumptions that will make a difference substantively. Any insights about that? And I think that might be our last question. 
I, I can do one minute, Julie, I think. So my whole, my, I spent 30 years in the HIV arena. And one of the things they did was talk about representation, both in terms of uh, DEI work, but also lived experience living with HIV. So we spent years trying to get pe the right people in the room. And then when we got them there, nobody felt comfortable being in the room. So this is not, you know, go to your, to your nearest black person who you feel comfortable with and have them represent all black people. Nor is it just because you have a person of color in the room that their competence is to the place to help and support, nor do they maybe feel empowered uh, to point out things that are a challenge, particularly if they're the only person in the room. So I actually think that the, the integration component of this is the freedom of taking the small organizations and translating that message up is something philanthropy has to fund. And we do fund it in our local place-based way. I agree with all of that. I also think that whether you're talking about a talent pipeline for board or staff of these organizations, or you're talking about your funding pipeline, um, both have been limited by networks um, and knowledge of that includes and excludes people often with a racial dynamic um, very much as part of it. And so as Randy said, it's you've got to be committed to the cultural change, whether that's, you know, it's great to hire diverse staff. Are you retaining it up and promoting them? Um, you aren't gonna be unless you're working on both sides of that coin. Same with your board. Um, and then with your grantees, are you widening and funding the pipeline and getting to know a broader set of grantees? But then is your process actually so cumbersome and so exclusive that you have to be a team of multiple professional grant writers to get through it? Um, all of those things, this has to be thought of in the full system. But also my, one of my favorite questions to ask, to ask grantees is who else should we fund? Right. And I often ask founders of color a lot of that question. Yeah. Um, first, if you aren't asking your grantees that question, you learn a lot yeah. in that question. Um, because the ones who answer it basically with us, give us more funding is a pretty good sign that they aren't collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, those who start listing a large set of people doing good work and with diverse leaders and diverse approaches, you really learn a lot that reflects as positively on them as anything. But that network growing and that asking of people who are closer to the community, who else, um, the reading, the getting, I mean, we are constantly trying to expand pipelines and networks. Um, you know, I happen to work in a massive organization where I can go to the Asian Pacific Islander resource group of employees um, and get feedback and get, have them make recommendations of organizations. You know, not everybody has that privilege, but the number of corporate funders who have it and don't use it is also high. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, really making sure you're thinking as broadly as you can about the network you have um, and empowering that network to give you advice and then using that network to then broaden your network is a really incredible gift um, when you can use it. And Gloria, if I may just say one more thing, you know, DEI is as a role and a principle it is something we all have to do and embrace. If you're fundraising, where are the conversations with donors? And in, you know, I understand a lot about the fundraising world. That's where I spent a big chunk of my career. And as you think about raising those dollars, I'm get continually frustrated by community foundations who say my donor doesn't want that. Well, have you talked to your donor about other ways of being? Um, so I think all of us have to reimagine something different because we're pushing against a status quo. And so you can't keep doing the same thing. And that's the part of why we have to go through some of the pain of talking to other white leaders and bringing it up and, you know, doing what we can where we are really, uh, is, is, the, is the great saying that, that is used throughout movements. Yep. So the two points that I would make as we close, um, one is, is this, this notion that um, people who are white in positions of power have to choose to use that power around DEI is pretty important. And we all know, the three of us talk a lot about this, if it comes from a 
a white person in a position of power, whether it's a board member, a stakeholder, a donor, it will carry more weight. And so we all know it's important, therefore, for us to educate our white uh, brothers and sisters who of goodwill so that they can be advocates. The gatekeeper status is one of the people I'm talking about. And then the other point that I think we want to make sure um, is an important takeaway, we're gonna be heavy handed about it, is to pretty much say that none of us are going to get where we want to go by being comfortable. And so a big part of demonstrating that we're embracing that discomfort and holding ourselves accountable is to come up with performance measures for our own organizations as strategic outcomes that we establish and for the, the performance of our team members, including our top members. I mean, my, the president of, of Florida International University gave me permission to say it's in his performance evaluation how much he advances around DEI. So we wanna make sure that, that that point gets mentioned. And then finally, I just want to thank you both for doing such a great job of demonstrating where the smart money is going. Uh, we are all activists to the core, all three of us. And um, our agenda is pretty explicit. We want to signal to um, all of you who are participating that there are, are people like Julie and Randy who are doing the good work, who are humble and leaning into um, learning as they go. And we want to encourage you to just find those kinds of, of, of um, potential partners, even if you're not looking for money from them, take advantage of the resources that they make available, the knowledge um, and the information that um, they provide from, from their research and what, and what have you, and see if, if you can leverage that um, to your own good. So I have to be a good girl for Columbia and do one final slide um, to remind everyone, if we can go please, Francis, to the reminder about the final uh, DEI series event. Uh, it's coming up on April the 8th. Uh, you can go to our website. We're going to give you all of our social media information to, to learn more about who those featured speakers are, but it's, it's going to be awesome because it's a mix. Uh, and they're all going to sort of share their unique perspectives and also talk about um, where there's divergence in the way they think about DEI uh, and where there is convergence. And so we hope that you will um, take advantage of that. I also want to remind you, if we can go to the final slide uh, that shows everybody our contact information, um, remind you that on uh, the Columbia University uh, website, the Nonprofit Management Program, which is the graduate program uh, where I work and where Cindy leads um, with lots of verve and vision, um, is uh, going to be a resource uh, for you for all things DEI. You'll have access to the recording uh, of this session as well as the deck, and there'll be some extra slides in there that are resource slides that we encourage you to um, avail yourselves of. I just, I can't say thank you enough um, to both, uh, both of you. You have lots of important things to be doing and somehow you squeeze this in both for the preparation and for doing it. And I just wanna say just what an honor and a blessing it is uh, for us to do this and to hopefully put all this love and knowledge out there and, and hope that people grab it. Thank you. If you have any other final words, we can all good. We can all get some dinner, maybe. <laughs> All right. I would like to thank Francis Labiscott, who has been great behind the scenes and helping to pull all of the pieces together. Um, you are a tremendous asset in every way uh, in the Columbia University. And I just want to thank you for the extra effort that you put into this at the end of a long day. Uh, and thanks to the rest of the team behind the scenes that's made it all happen, too. So with that, we wish you all love and light. Go in peace. Bye bye.